Okay, so your um, the the sheet that you downloaded just breaks it down. It just has kind of four main topics, and it has one bullet point there. That doesn't mean you have to have one bullet point. That's just starting the list of bullet points. So you can add as many bullet points as, as you want there, um, but you're not restricted to just you know that one bullet point. You should have more than that. Okay, so as I said, we're gonna we're gonna pick back up at our, our sort of overall look at the war with President. Johnson, um, and we're going to start in 1968, okay? Um, 1968 was an election year, it was an important year for Johnson and the Democratic Party because they're hoping to retain the White House. They're hoping to um, hold on to the White House. In January of 1968, right? an important event occurs that a lot of historians see as the turning point of the war, okay? the Tet Offensive. So what's that all about? Well, Tet is a Vietnamese national holiday. It's a celebration of the Lunar New Year. And up to this point, throughout the Vietnam War, both sides had agreed to a ceasefire during this period. Call off the fighting, go spend the holiday with your family, and then once the ceasefire is over, come back and fighting resumes. In 1968, the Viet Cong And the North Vietnamese Army decide to use this holiday to launch a coordinated surprise attack on the South. Which, if you're, you know, the Viet Cong, makes sense, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna launch a surprise attack during a holiday, who's not gonna be there to stop you? The uh, Southern Vietnamese. Yeah, right. The South Vietnamese soldiers. They're gonna be, they're gonna be at home. So it makes sense in terms of, of launching a surprise attack. So during the Tet Offensive, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese fighters use the holiday to launch a surprise attack against U.S. bases, cities across the South, and even the U.S. Embassy and the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon. During the Tet Offensive, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese launch this coordinated attack at the same time, right, same day, against a lot of different places in the South. And that included U.S. bases, other key cities in the South. And even the United States Embassy and the capital of the South, Saigon.
the U.S. and South Vietnam were initially caught off guard, but very quickly regained control of the situation and inflicted heavy losses on the Viet Cong. So from a military standpoint, the Tet Offensive was a failure for the North and the Viet Cong. But even though they were defeated, these attacks had a huge impact on public opinion in the United States. And I got a short video clip here to, to show you of um, an analyst talking about the Tet Offensive, kind of summarizing um, its importance. Possible to win a battle? lose the war. I'm Jill Lindsay, and this is Lesson Learned. Our topic today is the Tet Offensive, which began in late January 1968 and changed the direction of the Vietnam War. U.S. and South Vietnamese troops are hoping for a break from the fighting during that final week of January 1968. It was Tet, the beginning of the Lunar New Year, a time of great celebrations in Vietnam. In previous years, both sides have observed a ceasefire to allow the country to celebrate national holidays. But unbeknownst to the Americans in the South Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, the communist guerrillas operating in South Vietnam, had infiltrated towns and cities across the country. As the festivities for Tet began, they struck with ferocity, hitting targets like the Saigon International Airport, the Presidential Palace, and even the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. After the initial surprise wore off, U.S. and South Vietnamese forces responded with devastating effectiveness, repulsing the attackers and inflicting huge losses. The Viet Cong were broken as a military force for the remainder of the war. But while the United States military scored a victory on the battlefield at Tet, the effect at home was quite different. The fighting at Tet helped turn American public opinion against the war and persuaded Lyndon Johnson not to run for re-election. The discrepancy between what happened in Vietnam and what happened at home has generated a slew of books and articles arguing that the news media's coverage of the Tet Offensive turned the American public against the Vietnam War. To be <coughs> sure, the journalists got a lot of the facts wrong early on in the Tet Offensive. Most famously, journalists reported that the Viet Cong had invaded the U.S. Embassy, when in fact they only managed to get onto the embassy's ground. Many Americans were horrified to see a photo of a South Vietnamese Army general summarily executing a Viet Cong prisoner on the streets of Saigon. But the talk of how journalists covered the Tet Offensive misses the broader point. Context matters. Even before Tet, the American public had begun to sour on the Vietnam War. Polls done in the middle of the summer of 1967 so that a majority of Americans had concluded that the decision to become involved in Vietnam had been a mistake. The Johnson administration responded to these poll numbers by launching a public relations campaign to build support for the war. That included bringing home the commanding U.S. general from Vietnam who told the American public that an important point had been reached where the end begins to come into view. I am absolutely certain that whereas in 1965 the enemy was winning, Today, he is certainly losing. Tet shattered the claim that the United States was making progress in South Vietnam. Americans began talking about a credibility gap because the Johnson administration violated a cardinal rule of American politics, never overpromise and underdeliver. Preparing the public for setbacks and reversals is critical to succeeding with any foreign policy that requires a sustained political commitment. That lesson is worth keeping in mind if you talk about a potential military strike against Iran or intervening military 
militarily in Syria. The American public will be a great burden, but it wants to know what the costs are before the fighting begins. Okay. So he makes some, some comparisons there to things that are happening today. Um, and we'll kind of come back to that at the end of the lecture. Right. So, so he, he sort of summarizes what went down, talks about the, the important shift in public opinion. There's a graph in your book that some of you might have noticed, some of you might have skipped over, that shows the dramatic impact that the Tet Offensive had on public approval of the Vietnam War. Which it might be helpful to actually look at. On the left, you see here the approval rating of Johnson's presidency. On the right, the approval of Johnson's handling of the war. Now, in the light blue, it's before the Tet Offensive. It's not great, okay? Right? You had about 48% <laughs> approval rating, which is not great. But after Tet, it drops to 35, which is pretty poor. Handling of the war, you had about 38% prior to the Tet Offensive approved of his handling, and that dropped significantly to 25% or so afterwards. So in the wake of the Tet Offensive, three out of four Americans believed that Johnson was doing a bad job of handling the war. In the wake of this mounting opposition, and in the wake of the nosedive of his popularity and, and um, public opinion about his presidency, um, Johnson announces that he is not going to run for re-election, even though he could have. So this is a clip we saw in the film. right? This is, a, this is the real life version. That's his wife. Lady Bird. On America's sons in the fields far away. But America's future under challenge right here at home. With our hopes and the world's hopes for peace and the balance every day. I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office, the presidency of your country. Accordingly, I shall not see and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. So Johnson sort of shocks the nation there with that announcement. He, you know, kind of expected that he was going to run again, um, but decides not to because of that that drop in public opinion. So with Johnson out of the race in 1968, and with one of the front runners and favorites, Bobby Kennedy getting assassinated in 1968, the Democratic Party was, was kind of in disarray. And so the Republicans are able to step in and win back the White House in 1968. And the nation elects Richard Nixon, Republican from California, to take over the presidency. Did he go up against Kennedy? He did. He was defeated in uh, 1960 by Kennedy in, in a very close election. So he comes back eight years later and this time runs successfully for president. Nixon campaigned on a pledge to end the war. He gave speeches and ran ads that, that were like this. 
glittering generality for you right there. So with his pledge to, to end the Vietnam War, Johnson takes over and he wants to try to get North Vietnam to peace talks. And to try to help do that, he begins the policy of Vietnamization. We know that Johnson Americanized the war, right? Which meant that America took over the responsibility for fighting the Vietnam War. Nixon decides to Vietnamize the war, to do the opposite, right? To gradually withdraw U.S. troops and put the responsibility for fighting back onto South Vietnam. So because of this policy, the U.S. starts to shift from using ground forces to relying more on bombing raids. Cut back on ground troops, keep doing the bombing raids. And all of this was designed to try to encourage North Vietnam to come to peace talks, right? We mentioned that yesterday, that idea of the carrot and stick, right? That, hey, here, here's, here's a carrot, right? We'll cut back on troops. We'll even offer to, to maybe cut back on the number of bombing raids to try to get the North to peace talks. But... Peace talks failed. Peace talks failed several different times. Primarily because we weren't able to come to an agreement with the North over sharing power and keeping a divided Vietnam, a communist North, a non-communist South. If you remember, in Korea, that was the settlement. That was the, that was the peace settlement, right? That, that we, they would just stay divided. So we're trying to do the same thing in Vietnam. You guys keep the North, the South will stay democratic. And, and it's just the peace talks kept falling apart. So, we said yesterday, Nixon offers this carrot. North Vietnam refuses to take it. So what's he going to do now? Um, right, hit him with a stick. Okay. So, what that meant was increasing bombing of the North. And it also meant not only targeting the North, but targeting Viet Cong bases and supply routes in Cambodia. We mentioned that yesterday as well. 
It's a neighbor of Vietnam. The Viet Cong was using it for, for bases and, and to move supplies around. So Nixon not only says, all right, well, if you won't agree to peace talks, we're going we're gonna to ramp up the bombing, not only in the north, but we're going to hit secret bases and, and your supply routes and things like that in Cambodia. By 1973, both sides had finally agreed to come to a, a, a peace agreement. And in that year, 73, the U.S. and North Vietnam signed the Paris Peace Accords. The Paris Peace Accords. And there were really three main parts of the Paris Peace Accords. The first was that there would be a ceasefire. Right? Both sides agreed to stop fighting. The second point, key point, was that U.S. troops would withdraw from Vietnam. And the third point was that all U.S. prisoners of war, or POWs, would be released. So President Nixon goes on to national television and, and announces that he's made good on his campaign pledge. Right? He said he would get us out of Vietnam, and um, he effectively does with the Paris Peace Accords. So here's a clip of him actually announcing this to the country.
Throughout the years of negotiations, we have insisted on peace with God. And my addresses to the nation from this room, January 25th and May 8th, I set forth the goals that we considered essential for peace with honor. In the settlement that has now been agreed to, all of the conditions that I laid down then have been met. A ceasefire international supervised will begin at 7 p.m. this Saturday, January 27, Washington time. Within 60 days from this Saturday, all Americans held prisoners of war throughout Indochina will be released. There will be the fullest possible accounting for all of those who are missing in action. During the same 60-day period, all American forces will be withdrawn from South Vietnam. The people of South Vietnam have been guaranteed the right to determine their own future without outside interference. By joint agreement, the full text of the agreement and the protocols to carry it out will be issued tomorrow. Throughout these negotiations, we have been in the closest consultation with President Chu and other representatives of the Republic of Vietnam. This settlement meets the goals and has the full support of President Chu and the government of the Republic of Vietnam, as well as that of our other allies who are affected. The United States will continue to recognize the government of the Republic of Vietnam as the sole legitimate government of South Vietnam. We shall continue to aid South Vietnam within the terms of the agreement, and we shall support efforts for the people of South Vietnam to settle their problems peacefully among themselves. We must recognize that ending the war is only the first step toward building the peace. All parties must now see to it that this is a peace that lasts, and also a peace that heals and a peace that not only ends the war in Southeast Asia, but contributes to the prospects of peace in the whole world. All right, so Nixon lays out for the American people here, right, that, that here's the peace agreements, he lays out the three components of the peace agreement, and then at the end of that little clip, he says, oh, well, and... and President Chu, the, the president of South Vietnam, right, we've been in contact with him. This agreement has South Vietnam's full support. What do you think about that? You're shaking your head. Why? Because they know they'll lose. Okay. Yeah, do we really think that has the full support of South Vietnam? Is South Vietnam going to be happy that we're packing up and leaving? Probably not, Right? Um, the reason we took over is because they weren't getting it done, and now we're leaving. So why do you think he says that? Why does he say, oh, well, you know, this has the support of South Vietnam, and, and uh, why, why put that in there, then? So people accept the treaty? That's like the, that they know, like, when they're leaving, like, it won't be, like, uh, them and leaving. Yeah, we're, we're not just cutting and running, right? So he's putting that in there more for our reputation, right? Oh, well, you know, we're not, we're not just leaving here, right? This, South Vietnam's agreed to this too, right? They're, they're on board with this. So he's got that sense in there, again, peace with honor. We're, we're getting out of South Vietnam. Oh, but, you know, South Vietnam is, is on board with this. We're not just abandoning, abandoning an ally, right? So shortly after this announcement... Um, their ceasefire goes into effect, and not too much longer after that, um, fighting resumes again between the North and the South, but this time without U.S. involvement. So fighting breaks back out, but without U.S. involvement. Which brings us to... President Ford. For reasons that we'll learn about in about a week and a half or so, uh, <clears throat> Nixon does not finish his term. Right? He becomes the only U.S. president to resign from office. And when he resigns, um, he is replaced by his vice president, 
Gerald Ford. So at this point, U.S. involvement in Vietnam has come to a close, but the war itself is still going on. By April of 1975, the North had taken over most of Vietnam. And late in April, the Vietnamese capital city, South Vietnamese capital city of Saigon, was close to capture. So Gerald Ford uh, orders in late April 75 all U.S. personnel in the South to evacuate. Right? He says this thing is they're going to, North's ready to kick down the door. We're going to go ahead and get all of our people out. So the war, the Vietnam War itself, comes to a close when the North captures Saigon, defeats the South, and for a lot of Americans, one of the, the one of the lasting images of the war are scenes like this one. Here's a helicopter on the roof of the American embassy in Saigon, evacuating not just Americans, but also South Vietnamese who were trying to get out. And so, for a lot of Americans, you know, th this just sort of summed up the disappointment, symbolized the disappointment of the Vietnam War. After all of our sacrifice in money and in soldiers, after all that we had fought for in Vietnam, this was the end result, right? Um, that, we, that we evacuate Saigon as the North takes over the country. So that brings us to not only the end of the Vietnam War, but to some questions. What are some lessons to be learned from the Vietnam War? And ever since Vietnam ended, historians and politicians and others have debated and they have raised a lot of important questions about what we can learn from the Vietnam War. And these are questions that don't have clear-cut answers, even today. Okay? So I'm going to share a couple of those with you. One would be, how informed should the public be about what the military is doing? How much of a right to know does the public have during wartime? Are we supposed to answer these questions? Or are just... Well, if you can answer that question, you should go work in Washington. Right. So how informed should the public be during wartime? Right? You had folks looking back at Vietnam and saying, you know, we should have kept the public better informed. We should have let them know that, that this is really what we thought might happen or that, that it might require this much sacrifice in terms of money or troops. Um, pe you know, people don't want to be blindsided by that information. But then you have others who say, well, you can't tell the public everything. You know, it's a war. There, there are things you need to keep confidential. So that's an important question that, that we look back and go, well, gosh, we can maybe learn some lessons from that, from Vietnam. A second question that emerged from Vietnam, particularly from Vietnam, was should there be restrictions on the media during periods of war?
We know that the media played a really important role in shaping public opinion. Just today we talked about how the media reporting what happened in the Tet Offensive turned a lot of Americans against the war. And some of it was accurate, but some of it wasn't. Right? So how, how, uh, how much should the media be restricted? And how much should they be allowed to just openly report? Important questions we still don't really have answers to. A third one would be, how much of a voice should military leaders have in making policy decisions? We've seen in the, the films we've watched, 13 Days, Impact of War, right, that the military leaders advocated very hard for what they wanted to do. Um, and sometimes their advice was accepted, other times it was turned down. Um, but, but one of the questions there is, well, if it's a period of war, right, should, should military leaders have more say? Others say, no, we need, we need that civilian control over the military. And lastly, one that, that, that pops up quite a bit today in, in our role in the world today, to what extent should the United States involve itself in the affairs of other nations? This has come up in the news recently, with things going on in the Middle East, Libya, Syria, right? To, to, to what extent should we get involved there, and, and to what extent is that another country's problem, and they just need to deal with it? Tough questions that, are, that our leaders have to wrestle with, um, but I think that if there are, there are things that can be learned by looking back at our experience in Vietnam.